Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Achim Krenner. I'm the CFO of the Worth Additive Group. Um, I'm joined here today by our um, co-hosts from Mark Forge, um, Rod and Greg. Um, we're excited that you all joined us today um, in our webinar on adding additive to your organization. We're going to talk about how to start the conversation, how to kick off the, talking about additive in your company, uh, where to start, who to talk to, and what to talk about. Um, as always, we like to keep it interactive, so please make use of the chat function that you should see on your screen. Shoot us any questions you might have, and we'll try to address them as they come in, and we'll try to, to build them into our conversation here. Um, with that, I will hand over to um, our co-host, Rod, uh, for some introductions. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're pleased to have you join us today. I'm looking forward to about an hour long conversation. My name is Rod Chafee. I am a strategic sales manager with Mark Forged, and I'm gonna turn it over to Greg and let him introduce himself as well. <laughs> Thanks, Rod. Thanks, uh, Akeem. Yeah, my name is Greg Anicelli with Mark Forged. I'm a strategic sales manager as well. Um, I handle some of the, the largest strategic customers for Mark Forged. Um, based in the Midwest, um, and uh, it's, again, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Appreciate that, and to introduce myself, my name is AJ Strankwist. I'm the CEO of Worth Additive Group, uh, and really just excited for uh, Mr. Grainer to give us a master class in uh, making additive fit inside your, uh, your company, especially from the financial aspect, and maybe giving some uh, context around you know, why large manufacturing sites are finding those cost savings and that reason to invest. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Mr. Grainer. Thank you, I appreciate that. So today's uh, presentation, and again, um, please um, join us in the conversation. So please be, feel free to shoot in questions or comments uh, anytime in the chat function. Um, we prepared some slides for you, of course, um, so uh, you can take something home with you because um, what we usually like to do is not just give you a marketing presentation, but actually deliver content to you that you can turn around and use with your team, right? So um, we've split this into two parts. We thought that makes sense to just quickly recap um, on the value of digital inventory um, and the overall solution that Word and MarkForge together can. Um, provide to certain stakeholders in your company, right? So when you talk about additive, usually the engineers have a pretty good idea um, why it makes sense to have one, two, three, 20 3D printers in your organization. But how do you convey that message and how do you make your case to the people who actually have to okay that large uh, check you want to cut, right? How do you... Um, bring across that value that, um, that this solution has to the CFO or the CEO that you meet in your elevator and that are asking you, hey, I bought you this uh, expensive piece of machinery, what are you actually gonna do with it, right? Because they don't care about layer heights or any of the technical aspects, right? They wanna learn about what your vision is of a large additive program because we truly believe and we have made the experience especially Greg and, and with the large strategic international accounts and, and AJ who's been working tirelessly of communicating this message and, and forwarding this um, this value in our customer base with Word is that we know it has the potential to transform some of the aspects of, of your company and we're excited to share that today with you and um, that is part one really talking about hey what is it actually that we're proposing and then who in your company is responsible for um, some of those uh, those overlaps that uh, occur within AM. And then the part two is um, a very practical approach in where you can start today to think about driving value to your enterprise. Um, what could be if it was Christmas tomorrow and we had everything implemented tomorrow, what that could look like um, to, to get some, you know, to, to get some dreams uh, kicked off there. And then uh, really practical um, guides and, and a practical uh, checklist on how to start your journey with us, right? 
that's what I meant by we want not only to to give you a, a pretty presentation, but we want to we want you to take this presentation, turn around, talk to your uh, counterparts in, in in your company, and uh, explore how you can kick this off. And at the end of this presentation, there's going to be a little challenge, so so bear with us. Uh, and again, please feel free um, challenge us, question us, uh, tell us if we look funny in the video. Uh, please interact with us in the chat. We're looking forward to to kick this off. So the goal for today, I I, I touched on it a little bit is at the end of this, you should know who in your organization is a stakeholder to additive, how you can start a conversation with them, and what you actually you know, can, can kick off that project with, what kind of uh, uh, project. With that, I want to bring you um, a bit into the past. I think uh, AJ knows knows these uh, uh, units on the left much better than I do because he has been uh, he's been selling those uh, for the better part of his career. Uh, Virt is the largest industrial supplier for inventory and um, inventory management systems for industrial customers. I'm sure many of you guys are already a customer of Virt or um, maybe not. Um, in this case, it's a very quick recap. Um, in many of our customers, uh, warehouses and on, on their production lines, they have shelves and shelves of, of good inventory managed systems um, that they can just take their parts that they need every day. And um, at the end of the day, if, if the parts are running low or are empty, they will automatically get reordered and you never have to worry about managing your C parts. Essentially. Now, I want to take you on a little imagination, a little journey there, and just imagine we put something next to this or the uh, shelf, right? Something new, a new shelving unit, if you will, right? You have your old shelving unit that you worked on with your Word key account and you um, set together, you strategize the content of this shelf, what are parts you need regularly, um, you strategize the layout and you've created those labels and put those pins in place so you can use them every day. Now imagine we have a new shelving unit that we place next to it. And this new shelving unit you can decide the mix of your SKUs, the mix of your parts every day. Each day you can sit down and can think of, hey, what kind of parts do I need tomorrow to work with? And what if you could have an, a shelving unit that has exactly those parts ready to use on the next day? And further, you can imagine, hey, except for just creating a new mix, you can actually customize some of your existing SKUs without actually machining them, without actually touching them. Um, and you can customize them for safety. You can customize them to fit, better fit the needs that you have, or you can customize them because um, they you know, break easily and you want to perhaps reinforce them and make them stronger and, and last longer. That turns into the third point here. You can also improve the performance of your parts with um, you know, their, their strength parameters, their weighting, their cost even, or you, can, you could design entirely new SKUs um, that uh, you might need, you know, old warranty parts or tools that are um, maybe in use in lower volumes. And uh, as you can probably imagine, um, we already have um, a magic new, magic new shelving unit, which would be an industrial 3D printer powered by Mark Forge and their and Wirth's digital inventory system. Our overall value proposition is to combine your existing physical inventory managed solution by Beard and add to it the digital capabilities with a MarkForge industrial 3D printer. What that means is you already have a physical inventory solution and now we want you to think about a digital inventory that you can decide on, that you can decide the mix on and you can manage um, your parts, you can manage the way the parts fit into your organization, where they are, when they appear at the location of your choosing. And this blends into the large overall value proposition that we want to kind of tease right now with you only. And Greg later on will go into more detail as to how that will actually looks with already with some of our customers um, that are using this every day. Right, so imagine you would have your center of excellence, your engineering center uh, in the US, and you have ownership over your digital inventory. 
Now, potentially, with, with a partnership of Grid and MapForge, you can have that digital inventory system implemented with an on-site printer in any location of your choosing. I stop right there because it is kind of a big, big, uh, you know, it's kind of a big thing to swallow because it's you kind of think about okay, now we have a 3D printer in uh, Australia. What does that do? You know, what does that? What can that do for us? Um, we're gonna go into that a little bit um, later with with AJ and Greg to talk about um, what. Um, our customers are already doing with this, but just keep in mind, um, this is something that is happening today and that could happen with your organization as well in the very near future. And what this enables is it makes it very easy for you to really clamp down on some of the big topics that we have um, going on in the industry right now. You can think about predictive line down management. Over 70% of uh, industrial OEMs, for them, it's a top priority to avoid line downs. Think about the critical parts that may be a pain to double source. Think about uh, sustainability uh, KPIs that you work on with uh, your uh, sustainability department. Think about all the, the vendor bases you could cut down and you can bolster and secure your supply chain. You can think about rapid on-site prototyping, um, product development, quality management, all those things. We're gonna go into a bit more detail on that um, and into more of, a, of, a, of a, an overview of a, what's happening in these areas right now with uh, our and Greg's and Nature's customers. Now that we know, um, Kind of the recap what we actually want to talk about here uh, which is a global additive program um, let's think about the stakeholders of this global additive program and let's quickly go over our stakeholders what are their concerns and what's the value of additive manufacturing to those stakeholders right most people and that, that is also true for most of our customers they're the engineers or the tool group managers that approach us and they say, hey, we identified a couple applications where it might make sense to use an industrial 3D printer instead of laborious machining um, or minimum order quantities um, with, uh, with outside vendors. So on the application level, an application means a, a concrete case in which you bring value to your organization. We talk to engineers, we talk to, talk to tool group managers. Their concerns are lead times for the parts that they need to keep their line running. Their concerns are part quality, um, cost of their parts, productivity, safety. And what Additive can do for them is, we think back to that global program slide that I had just the one slide uh, um, earlier, is you can have an on-site and in-time manufacturing process, especially for low volume parts. You can have highly customized parts um, that are better for safety or productivity and cost. DFAM is short for design for additive manufacturing. That means if you design your products and if you design your tools with additive manufacturing in mind, you can drastically improve all of those KPIs that are important to engineers and tool group managers. Further, we think about equipment, right? You make a decision, you figured out a couple applications, you wanna make that purchase. Now, who do you talk to? Someone needs to buy that printer, right? You talk to CapEx managers. The CapEx managers are concerned with the cost of ownership of their machines. They're concerned with product liability. They're concerned with stocking spare parts and bringing, um, keep, keeping the machine running, especially if we're in a production environment. You know, you need just as much as you need the SKUs in your uh, Wirt Aussie shelf you will need materials to keep your printers running. This is where the partnership with Mark Forge and Wirt has that, that value of, we can create an instant ROI for customers by making the entry into this program very, very easy. For example, we have a renting financing program where there's not a huge CapEx in front of the uh, project, right? There's a, there's a low cost of entry, high value solution with MarkForge uh, being on the forefront um, of their field and um, with 
most of our customers, Greg, I think in the preparation for, for this meeting, we talked about most of them have um, the, the, um, their, their projects make sense after six months already. So it's a very, very short-lived ROI cycle if you think about that. Um, talk about inventory. Um, that's, that's AJ's dojo. We're talking about warehouse managers. We're talking to the purchasing people, the plant managers. They're worried about the cycle time of their inventory. They're worried about line downs, minimum order quantities. They don't want to deal with having um, overshoot inventory occupying their warehouse space. Right? They don't want to deal with uh, two or three vendors for one part where they can create a redundant solution in-house. Think about what that does to, to their uh, cost and their admin overhead calculation. This is where our CPS integrated solution with MarkForge really plays into um, their needs, right? That RC shelf in the very beginning of the presentation, you put your 3D printed parts in the same racks and bins that you already use with Word. And once those printed parts run empty, the same account manager from Word will come by, will scan that bin, and it will trigger a new print job in your printing queue. And you have a very, very integrated solution that um, is not even a new thing to learn, essentially. All you need to learn is how to take the parts of the machine. And even I was able to do that, and I'm the numbers guy. So I, I managed to do that without breaking the part. Um, and then you can think about your large programs, right? This is where executives are concerned with how can I improve the efficiency and security of my supply chain? We all seen the pictures uh, of the Suez Canal. We've all, uh, I think by now, um, experienced the supply chain disruptions that are happening right now with price increases, with vendors not being able to deliver, with container space running low. How do, you, and how do you empower your organization to look past that and to manage it actively, right? Start today to identify the parts that could run low next week, month from now, and how can you strategically work on creating digital twins of those parts just in case? And that is a strong, strong value that is a high focus on uh, for many of our customers right now. Well, and I Executive. think I need to... Oh, I need to jump in. Oh. Thank you, appreciate it. Is, uh, as you look at this, I think what you should take away from this slide is if you want to make a large company-wide change, like if you really want to, for instance, when you install a new lean initiative in your building, that's not an easy task. That's something that goes across every different department that operates in that building if it's going to be sustainable. So I think what you're seeing here is if you want to get outside of you know, R&D and product development and prototyping, and you want to be a everyday solution inside of a, build, of a large uh, manufacturing site, you have to have that infrastructure and that support across the organization, or it's not a very sustainable effort. If buyers don't understand the advantage of perhaps the cost of having 3D printing a solution, and they only see a piece price on the spreadsheet next to it, they'll probably have a hard time accepting that price. But if you go a little deeper and they don't have a minimum order quantity or they don't invest in tooling, now all of a sudden you have more people in your organization a little more savvy about this new technology you're, you're utilizing. And now when it comes across those different departments, they know how to handle it and how they can put it into their everyday workflow um, and be advantageous for them, not just for the engineering department or for the tool crib, for instance. Thanks, yeah, to that point, um, I'll, I'll kind of uh, talk about a couple things here as well. And, and the first is, you know, typically speaking, uh, and we're going to talk about, um, you know, how a lot of companies first start. And it really does come down to looking at, you know, raw cost. And we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But one of the uh, the incredible um, byproducts of bringing in at, at bringing in additive from an organization really comes down to those those lead time reductions right and I'll, I'll give an example of one of our um our large auto uh manufacturers uh who's been a uh, an early adopter of our technology and they, and they have an additive program uh that spans across multiple sites across north america and with this particular customer um the program resides with their um their kaizen group um, to doing you know, continuous improvement in both manufacturing, engineering, and product 
production engineering. And the the interesting thing that the byproduct they didn't realize was that um, because they can do uh, they can produce prototypes um, and production tooling so much faster um, and go from from prototyping to production, um, they reduce their cycle times tremendously. Um, and the combination of both being able to do it for for a cheaper cost um, was actually secondary to the fact that. Um, and in many facilities, I can't tell you how many that I go across, they kind of run into the same boat. I can't tell you how many times I see, you know, um, jerry-rigged um, tooling or solutions because, frankly, they just don't have the, the time um, to come up with a, a, a solution. So talk about duct tape and bailing wire, trying to keep production moving. Um, I know, you know, there's probably a million people that can relate to the same, to the same thing in your own plants, right? Well, the, the ability to create prototypes and um, do functional testing um, and get to a production uh, tool faster um, all of a sudden opens up. There are probably thousands of projects um, that many of these continuous improvement engineers can think of where it's like, hey, I'd love to do that, but the cost, I know it's, it's going to be out of our uh, ability from a cost and a lead times perspective. It doesn't make sense. Right. So this particular OEM, um, they went from doing about 80 projects, continuous improvement projects a year uh, per um, engineer to over 350 projects per year, which really opened up their ability to do more, not only more projects, but solve problems a lot faster. Now think about the rippling effect across an organization when you can, um, when you can Um, and solve more problems faster. Um, and this is the type of impact that a program like this can have over time. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate that. Uh, a sprinkle of the real world here with my uh, my more theoretical uh, slides. But uh, uh, no, I think I think you both are full of those stories, and and I'm really looking forward to to hearing hearing more about that. The really the thing we want to give you today to take with is with this slide is here you have a list um, of, of stakeholders that we've um, learned about, right? We're sharing our experiences with you with this list. Um, we're sharing with you the concerns that, that we were able to address with, with the global program. Um, but essentially, you're not going to be able to start with a, with a global um, very large spanning program, right? You're likely going to start a bit slower. Um, as Greg put it, most customers start with a raw cost um, application. And um, with that, we'll turn over to part two of this um, presentation. And uh, you'll learn about how to drive the um, value in your enterprise with the tech today and tomorrow, and um, how you can actually start right now, um, hit us up, and, um, and think about parts. Um, and Greg, I'll let you talk this slide. Awesome. Thanks, Akeem. So, um, yeah, you know, as, as Akeem said earlier, um, you know, we're going we're gonna to show you the art of the possible, right? Uh, if you were to, to be able to think about the ideal solution for your organization to help you manage MRO to both reduce costs and lead times across your entire enterprise, um, th this is what forward-leaning, um, innovative, uh, Fortune 500 companies are, are doing with additives today. Some of our, our you know, early adopters have, have done this. So everything I'm going to talk about right now is actually capabilities that we are currently in production with some of our customers today, right? And, and the first thing you'll notice is, you know, creating a, um, you know, a digital parts inventory that resides in, in the cloud, right? And having this cloud-connected network of 3D printers across all of the different facilities uh, in your enterprise. Um, and then, you know, there's some implied requirements, uh, really required capabilities that any solution like this would, would need, right, which is extremely secure, right? So um, ISO 27001 certification, uh, things like uh, SAML uh, single sign-on for identity management, um, being able to support all of your global 
um, users, everyone from the senior executives in the C-suite all the way down to your individual um, engineers and even uh, printer technicians at all the sites. And you can see here that um, you know, there's a global parts uh, managers, a centralized group of, of additive experts, if you will, uh, that know how to design for additive manufacturing, optimize for the process. That's where a lot of your engineering design work uh, and certification happens uh, to get those parts in the inventory. But once those parts are, are designed and in, in, in the inventory and can be shared across the entire uh, spectrum of your, your enterprise, you have individual um, you know, technicians um, that don't necessarily have to be um, additive experts or even know how to design for additive for that matter. All they need to know is how to operate a printer on site um, and find those parts in the virtual inventory um, and then print those parts on demand and on site when they need them. Um, and managing this um, type of a solution, it, you know, is really a business transformation. Um, and it does require quite a bit of people process and technology to come together to make this a reality happen. So, um, but you know, the, obviously the, the, the benefits of a global program like this are that you can now de-risk your supply chain. You can print things on site, on demand, just in time delivery. You have the entire organization upskilled and up-leveled uh, as far as, you know, designing for additive, um, you know, to you know, continue to, to find value in this platform. Um, and then obviously doing all of this at scale with um, the ability to do continuous improvement across an organization. Um, you know, this is the reality of some of our, again, um, forward leaning, innovative customers today. Um, but this is not where you are, right? So what, what I wanna do is, now we have a path to get you there. And this is what we call the maturity curve. And that's what you're looking at right now. And um, obviously, um, as a company builds uh, their, their internal maturity around additive manufacturing, uh, you start to move along this curve from left to right. Um, but, but everyone needs to start somewhere, which typically is um, finding parts that where you can save a lot of time uh, from a lead time perspective and just straight raw cost. Um, now, all you need to know right now is that we have um, – um, a very deliberate and proven approach to helping our customers evolve along this additive um, maturity curve. Um, but we're, what we're going to focus on with you today is, is where to start um, and how to, you know, identify what are the right applications and the right places um, to to start your program to get some really some quick wins. Okay, um, but in, in the process. Um, know how to set this up for success for, for the long term, okay? So when you start to think about what your, your uh, Kanban looks like today, this is probably very, very familiar to many of you, right? In that you have um, a, a, a vast bulk of the parts that you see in the middle, uh, which is like 80, 80 to 95% of your parts, uh, where there's economies of scale. And, and traditional manufacturing really, you know, is probably the is best suited to, to address those parts. Then there's about five to 15% of your parts, which are in the blue circles there, <clears throat> that are extremely low volume, high mix, very difficult to source, uh, and extremely expensive. And they can sometimes make up about 80% of the opportunity, the value at stake, if you will, to find better solutions. And these, these are the applications that are typically um, best suited for, for additive, okay? So we're talking about, um, you know, MRO, um, custom tooling, um, <clears throat> you know, things that need to be, um, you know, durable and functional, um, but obviously, you know, if you're outsourcing them currently to third parties and sometimes overseas, um, it's those lead times and those costs that are killing you. Um, so that's what we're gonna kind of focus on today. So, so next slide. Uh, maybe I could just jump in here and ask um, ask AJ. Um, I mean, we, we we show this slide all the time. Um, can you give us an example um, of a, of a customer interaction where that has especially resonated with, where some of the everyday cost savings uh, really made a made an impact, where we were able to uh, drive this really home? And just to give an example for our um, attendees. Sure. I mean. 
probably the most public example we have is with Bestus, where I think the key to what we're trying to show with that slide is that um, you can have this very familiar interface with these 3D printed SKUs that you identify. So the same tool crib managers, the same uh, line people or line operators and assembly technicians, they're gonna go to that same location, look for the same part number and grab it out of the bin, right? It's just with Worth's history and we're able to kind of help forecast um, based on print time, based on how many you use, we kind of take our old experience and apply it to help make sure you never run out. And so with instant, for instance, with Vestas, who we'll talk more about later, but there's a, a large range of very simple parts that Worth collaborates with Vestas on their building just to help keep track because they've helped digitize the inventory. It becomes an everyday item, let's say a, uh, a blemish inspection tool, something very simple. We'll get into more complicated later. But just like at the rental car place, it's a little sizer. If there's a blemish larger than that, that's not acceptable, right? But that little tool was designed and approved by a Vestas employee. It's in their digital library, they own their IP. But what we did is helped integrate that into their daily operations in a very simple fashion. So that that tool crib operator, or that line technician can go there, grab the tool, but they don't have to know how to reprint it. They don't know how to design it, et cetera. They're just going to the, uh, 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 the racks and bins and grabbing what they need to do their job type of thing. Thanks. And um, Greg has prepared some more exciting parts. Uh, so uh, Greg, um, talk to us more about what are we looking at right now? Yeah, so, you know, to put things into some context for you as far as what that, that last graph was showing, right? You know, all of these parts um, are great examples of the type of, of functional parts that Mark Forge can, can produce. Um, and typically, we can reduce cost of these parts by upwards of 90% and reduce lead times by 90%. So I'll, I'll kind of show and, and tell a story about some of these. So in, in number A or letter A, you see there that those are some functional prototypes uh, from one of our, our customers in the um, in the window manufacturing business. And obviously being able to rapidly prototype and drive innovation for new product introduction was the, the, the use case here and, and actually having some uh, some tooling around that as well from a from a manufacturing and a testing perspective. Um, you know B um, is some you can see some end effectors there. Uh, so non marring um, lightweight end effectors to help um, you know improve performance and functionality of some collaborative robots and, and automation within your process. Uh, so things that are typically like you know maybe machined out of aluminum, uh, now we can we can you know um, 3D print with our process with our unique uh, differentiated capability of putting continuous fiber reinforcement, whether it's carbon fiber or fiberglass but continuous fibers within a part makes it stronger than um, uh, 6061 T6 aluminum. Um, and to that point, if you look at um, you know, letter C, here's, a, here's another example of a, of a 3D printed part that's actually an assembly. It's a lifting tool. Um, and this was a, a tool that was created for Wardzilla. Um, and you know, what's amazing about this tool and just talks to the strength and the capabilities of our process and the continuous fiber reinforcement. This tool is actually rated to lift um, over uh, 960 kilograms, and it was CE certified, which is similar to, um, you know, um, um, an, a, a, an engineering certified part in the United States. Um, but you know, this part in particular was able to save them over $100,000 in eight months from an ROI perspective, which was which is incredible, right? Um, you know, our machines in, in many cases, when you find the right application like this, they pay for themselves within a month or two, uh, which quite frankly is, is unheard of in this space, right? Um, but frankly, um, you, know, you know, those are the types of applications that, that you know, we can help you find. Another great example is, is in D, right? Um, these large end effectors, typically machined out of aluminum, or in this case, this was made out of steel, um, and, you know, we were able to use our continuous fiber reinforcement, um, as well as our 3D metal printers to create the wear pads, and it's a hybrid part. So we were able to lightweight, 
the, the, the part itself, making this um, a lot you know, easier to replace from a, a safety and an ergonomics perspective, which was actually a huge part of the business case here uh, from an operator having this, to swap these things out. Um, it, was a, it was a huge safety concern. Uh, so we were able to lightweight the, the tool, make it extremely uh, durable um, and functional with our continuous fiber reinforcement. And then anytime they need to replace those wear pads, it's a much cheaper option to just to replace those, those pads themselves. Uh, e is another example of a, of a high, um, uh, you know, a very precise inspection gauge uh, for one of our customers, Deco. And, you know, this is an example of being able to produce some, some you know, very accurate um, and dimensionally tolerant parts with our 3D printing process. Uh, we're very unique in the space that we actually have an onboard laser micrometer on the printer, um, as well as something called Blacksmith, which allows you to calibrate your printers uh, to reduce the machine-to-machine the -machine variability across um, if you have multiple machines at multiple sites and you want to have very consistent parts, no matter where you're printing them, uh, we can calibrate our, our 3D printers and do a laser inspection of those parts um, after they've been printed to make <clears throat> to allow you to calibrate the tooling as well. Um, and again, these are more some some more sophisticated uh, programs, but these are all capabilities that are available in our platform today. Um, and then I'll, I'll leave it with uh, letter F. Um, here's an MRO solution um, by one of our um, strategic customers, Siemens, um, and this was a custom tool um, that in the past, um, you know, they uh, obviously were, um, they had custom tooling that was really expensive, uh, long lead times to, to have these MRO solutions, and um, Siemens was able to actually rapidly innovate and design an even better uh, tool using our 3D printing capability with the the continuous fiber reinforcement rapidly innovate until they got an even better solution was able to improve product quality um, as well as reduce costs um, and and free up a lot of the the money that they had with with putting uh, spares on shelves right uh, being able to free that up by making things more on demand in real time uh, so these are the types of parts um, that are really in the sweet spot, and we'll kind of show a little bit more about that on the next slide. But any other comments for the for the team here? Yeah, I think if you want to help quantify it, because obviously you can see a lot of engineering uh, on the page here, but as you're not only going to have to convince somebody that you need this tool to be able to be creative, is to add that context of we send out uh, X amount of tooling per year to an outside service provider and that takes x amount of money or we are machining simple jigs and fixtures or, inter or different uh, arm effects things like that uh instead of just hitting print and then we, when we leave the building that light and turn the lights off you know it's continuously building that part and you don't have a skilled machinist turning uh plastic for instance um so i think that again as you look at this is it's not only allowing you to design and engineer differently is take that, but as you're talking to your colleagues across the organization, is talk about we have 15 uh, tooling providers and we're trying to get that down to three, et cetera, because those things do add up. Um, I would ask your purchasing department, department how much it costs to cut a purchase order today and how much they think on average it costs them to manage a vendor per year. Those are two things that at that executive level and at that larger buyer level, they take that into consideration um as they set up their vendor base so definitely get some of that uh some of that context it'll make your business case much more robust so just to reiterate um you know where the sweet spot is for for additive manufacturing today um and where you can start driving value for or your organization um, is really in this low to medium volume um, with moderate to high loading requirements. So again, the custom tooling jigs and fixtures um, that have extremely high cost because they're machined, um, either machined plastics or machined aluminum, or even in some cases machined steels. Um, you know, those are typically the areas that we find, you know, fu functional prototyping, uh, your custom tooling, um, in some of your bending uh, tools and, and other 
um, as well as some uh, other MRO type applications. Really, that's where we find the sweet spot for Mark IVs in our technology, both from a composites with the reinforcement and, and on the metal side. Um, we do see some low volume, high mix end use parts. Um, but, you know, frankly speaking, from, my, you know, from experience, a lot of times it'll take a lot longer to get those types of parts approved in your process. Um, so our suggestion is starting with the tool, the, the lower risk parts, the tooling jigs and fixtures and MRO, um, and then we can start to pick off if there's any opportunities for production parts, um, you know, end use production parts. Um, we can start to take a look at those and go through your your certification process in in house to start producing production. But um, you know, obviously, um, you know, you know, the whole industry is looking down to the future as far as getting into more production and end use parts. Um, and the 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 printers themselves are are growing in capabilities from a speed um, and a reliability perspective and a quality perspective. So. Um, we are definitely heading in that direction, um, but just to, you, you know, what I always like to tell customers is you really need to, to learn how to crawl before you can run. And what we really need to do is, you know, find the low risk, uh, um, high impact parts in the tooling jigs and fixtures, starting there, um, learning how to build the expertise and make additive a part of your DNA today, so that as the capabilities um, and, and the technology continues to improve, you're ready to make that pivot um, and take advantage of that new technology as it comes online. So, you know, how to begin the, the journey with us. Um, you know, obviously Mark Forge and, and, and your Worth uh, team, um, you know, we, we have a, an army of, of additive experts um, that we have to bear with our customers. My recommendation is, um, you know, take this information that we kind of shared with you today, um, start having some conversations with, with the engineers, um, as well as your, your finance department um, and, and others, uh, the other key stakeholders that we talked about, um, and start to look for applications in your process that we kind of share with you today. Re definitely reach out to us. Um, part of what what we do with customers is we like to do on-site workshops. Um, and I know the, the, the worst team can kind of talk about what we do for that. Um, and we can come on site and we can help you, um, you know, not only educate your, your, you know, the other folks within your facility, but we can help you start to help identify where are those, those great applications to start with high impact, low risk, um, and really begin your journey with um, a Mark IVs and Worth solution uh, for helping you reduce costs and lead times. So uh, I know AJ probably has some, some comments here as well as far as what, what we like to do for, for customers as well. No, I think it leads into kind of what we our big focus on is <clears throat> having a large network of engineers um, to support our industrial customers, right? So I do think that we built our uh, our little company here around knowing that we think the power um, is when the multitude of your employees know about the technology and what it can do, right? So uh, just to give an example is, um, I don't, for my company, it's mostly engineers, but for a lot of companies, the engineering department um, might be the minority in the company, right? It's not the most numbers of everybody. So I think as you look at it, you might only have four, a handful of engineers and you have the printer in your office and you're doing product development and you're coming up with parts. But what we've really found a lot of success in is you've got to get down to that operator level and not the operator of the printer, but the operator of, of who's in your building, putting, cutting, welding, assembling, things like that, is because those are the folks that with this added education and enablement, the next time they see an issue or an OSHA problem, for instance. Um, now, before they might have mentioned, hey, there's a sprocket and a gear that's somewhat open, and I'm, you know, there's a chance I might bump into it and it could, you know, injure me. Is before you're having to figure out who's going to bend the steel, how do you size it, who's going to do that, I, then you have to install it, as opposed to now you've got a device that if you can get the rough sketch done on a CAD file, convert it, 
and you have a chance to print it because it's just shielding you from the sprocket, right? It doesn't need to, to be made of metal or, or uh, even carbon fiber for that matter. But it's giving that tool to as many folks as possible in the organization to feed your competence centers, right? So you might have your uh, engineers who really drive and um, kind of uh, approve and certify, quote unquote, or perform the ICERs for your parts and approve them. But a lot of the time they're being fed by those day by the folks that are working every single day, seeing those issues on the floor, that it needs a, a unique solution. It needs some flexibility. And of course, that's like we've been talking about the whole time. That's where additive is great, is when you need a lot of creativity and flexibility. And perhaps it's not 10,000 of them a year, perhaps it's 10 a year. Um, and in that case, it's extremely difficult not to find a cost savings with additive unless it's very, very simple geometry. And that's just, it comes down to human time, effort, um, and the effort it takes to source it versus capital or uh, rental or capital equipment uh, uh, and how you put that on your books um, versus your cost savings. So I think with that, that leads nicely into, we wanted to leave with kind of a call to action being that we do a lot of webinars, and maybe I'd hand it over to Mr. Uh, uh, Grainer to see uh, our polite challenge to the to the audience. Our polite challenge to the audience is uh, to actually challenge us, right? We challenge you, challenge us. Uh, we're ready to roll. Um, I hope um, with uh, the past couple of slides, we painted the, the picture for you um, of um, how to work through um, your your warehouse your tool grip with us um what our vision is for the tech uh and for how it can help you um with being you know a more sustainable company a safer company a, a more cost effective and stable company um that um, works um strategically in um optimizing their their SKU range their vendor base and uh, working out the you know the kinks of a global global additive program and how to implement digital inventory um, together with your physical inventory plan strategy for the future. And our challenge to you is um, to be bold, reach out to us, um, contact us for an on-site workshop. We have um, coverage um, worldwide to work with you and um, build out um, um, a case for additive in your company. Um, we will help you to identify enough applications to get one of the cool printers that's that's a promise and if we can't do that we will pay for all the coffee that we'll drink um at your location um i mean it's 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 kind of it's kind of uh you know it's a, it's a funny way way to bring it across but um i think i want to leave with this we're very confident that um this technology has the capability to eventually transform parts of of a business and uh, it will help your um, organization to just get better you know just get better on in their process in their operations in their supply chain and get more sophisticated and work on a lot of problems before they before they arise so um, that is our presentation um, I hope it was valuable to you Obviously, um, this will be shared with the, the circle of attendees. Um, and I have not seen um, any complaints so far in the in the chat section. So I think we we were doing not too bad. Um, but with this, we have ten minutes left, uh, right on the spot. So we're happy to take any more questions that you um, might have. Here, Garrett from Worth Comms here. It looks like there is one question in the in the questions tab. It says, is this program designed for distribution partners as well as manufacturers? Yep, is yes. So I, we actually have, uh, it's a, probably some will do a separate webinar on, is partnering with the OEMs of the clips, clamps, and widgets that we work with today um, to give them that same flexibility. So Really, this technology is a lowest common denominator type technology, similar to cell phones or a fax machine, is it's going to change how it changes how companies communicate uh, to what Mr. Grainer said. And so that goes for people producing C parts and tier twos, tier ones, the OEM. I mean, 
um, everybody will see an impact um, just because it has that underlying convenience of being a lightweight manufacturing method, just like cell phones and email are a very convenient, lightweight way to communicate, right? So yes, is is that gets into now you get into when the uh, people that are building those widgets now they can get into protecting their IP, taking their designs and making that a master, similar like you might do with uh, the digital version of music. I mean, there's a whole lot of sophistication that's going to come uh, as people make printed parts uh, uh, as a final product for people as well. Hopefully that answered that. But I mean, I'm sure we'll be circling up with the folks that attended because we do appreciate your time. And hopefully if you joined us today, you're trying to push that ball uphill just like we are, which is uh, to have additive be wider, more widely adopted um, and be more mainstream. You know, where we don't want to hang out in the corner by ourselves anymore at the party. We want to be a part of like the mainstream manufacturing, uh, uh, you know, workflow. And I think that's what we want to tackle with people that have that same kind of goals and aspirations. So we'll be sure to be following up with people and uh, seeing how else we can uh, push the ball forward with you. Awesome. Thanks, AJ. I think uh, I won't even attempt to, to get any better closing remarks done. So uh, with that, thank you everyone for your time. Appreciate everyone uh, tuning in and we'll look forward to hear from you. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks everyone. Yeah. Appreciate your time.